Hi friends, welcome to Classic Education's YouTube channel. Let's learn today something about election process in India. Okay, we are witnessing various kinds of elections in India. There are some issues involved in conducting the elections. Every now and then you might be hearing some of the uh, very burning issues related to the election process in India. Okay. We will learn about uh, the election system or the issues related to the elections in India. See, as you all know that India is the democratic country. That means here the government is of the people. It is formed by the people and this government is meant for the people. Right? See, in this way, as the Abraham Lincoln, the former president of the United States of America, he said that the democracy is nothing but it's the government of the people, by the people and for the people. In India, we are witnessing the same kind of uh, uh, governance system since the beginning of the constitutional process in India. Okay, We have adopted the constitution in the year 1949 and this constitution came into existence or it came into effect from the 1950, January 26th. Okay. So from that day onwards, we are you know witnessing the democracy in India. For the first time, the elections were conducted in India in the year 1951. That is, the first general elections to the uh, Lok Sabha were you know, held in the year 1951. That is, from October 1951, October 1951 to 1952. That means uh, until February, February 1952 from October 1951. See, this was the period during which the first elections were held and we all know that the first election commissioner, uh, the chief election commissioner who headed the election commission of India was Sukumar Singh. Okay. From this point onwards, India started to witness a completely different process which is core at the democratic process in India, right? That is nothing but the elections, right? See, I said India is a democratic country. This democracy is representative democracy, right? It is also called the electoral democracy. Here, we the India, we the people of India are the electors. We are the sovereign authority. That means in India, who is the sovereign? That means who is the super most powerful person? That is none other than the, the general public. We the people of India are the sovereign. Right, all the powers are vested in the people, but being a democracy and being the largest democracy, that means having the 130 crore of a population, it is difficult to manage the governance by involving all the 130, 130 crore people. Right, what we are doing in a representative democracy, we the people of India as a whole, we are electing some of the representatives who will go to the legislative legislation making bodies like state legislative assemblies or to the parliament where the laws are made where the debates discussions and various discourses are conducted they are going to such bodies and they are making the laws right they are making all these on behalf of the people who elected them right this is the representative democracy or electoral democracy that means in people will elect their representatives these representatives will make the laws on behalf of the people see in this way we have made the whole the whole governance process very easy though we are the largest country by population as of now we are very near to the china right i think uh, very in the near future we will we will be crossing the china in terms of the population size but the democratic, being a democratic country, we are the largest populated country having the democratic setup. See, all such a you know, huge population is manning, uh, managing the uh, governance, it is through this representative democracy. That means, large number of people will elect very small number of representatives and this small number of, on behalf of the people, they will make laws and they bring, bring the, those laws into Effect. Okay, so this is nothing but the electoral representative. Uh, sorry, electoral uh, democracy or representative democracy. In this democratic setup, we have various levels of you know uh, quality. That means it is India in quality is called dual quality, right? Not only dual, it is a third tier governance. 
So at the top level we have the central government, at the you know, middle level we have the state governments and at the lowest level or at the third tier level we have the uh, urban local bodies in the urban areas and panchayat raj institutions in the rural areas. In this way the whole country is you know, uh, managed very effectively. Okay, see for all these you know, legislative uh, legisl uh, law making bodies like the parliament or to the state assemblies and even in the uh, gram panchayats, the elections are held from lowest level that is from the gram panchayat to the state to the parliament. There are continuous elections in India. Elections are at the core of re uh, democracy in India. Without elections, India cannot be imagined, right? See, sometimes these elections are also called as the you know, festival of democracy. Various, you know, constitutional experts or various political, you know, uh, uh, experts, they are uh, often tell that elections are nothing but the festival of democracy in India. Indian, you know, uh, elections are very well known across the world for their fair and, you know, free manner, right? These con elections are held without any bias. These conduct uh, elections are held in a free environment, right? See, this is the election process and various, you know, levels of you know, uh, government's organization. The constitution itself provides for these elections, right? This election, this is, we have the very, uh, you know, uh, important scripture in India, that is the constitution of India. This constitution of India provides for the election process. Who has to manage these elections, how the elections should be conducted, how the president should be elected, how the vice president should be conducted, all these are you know, uh, you know mentioned in the constitution in detail, right? The elections are the product of the constitution, that is the, uh, the statutory book of India, right? The constitution of India. This constitution uh, has various parts, one of the parts like part 15, right? Part 15, it talks about the elections. Part 15 having the articles from 324 to 329, these articles provide for the you know, election process in India. Uh, that is you know, uh, universal adult franchise, the election commission of India, right? manner of election, all these are mentioned in these various articles you know, which are coming under the part 15 of the constitution. Right? These are the constitutional provisions related to the elections in India. Now, why we are talking about this topic, there must be some reason behind that, right? Since we, because we are discussing this topic, that means there must be some reason. See, that reason is nothing but Election Commission of India recently gave its newest recommendation to the government, right? The recommendations of this Election Commission of India were that it said that amend the section 23 clause 7 of the Representation of the People Act 1951 to allow the one candidate to contest from only one seat. Okay, this is one recommendation, and another recommendation was that the candidate who won both the seats should bear the financial burden of conducting the subsequent by election in the one of the constituencies, right? These are the two very important recommendations made by the Election Commission of India. What it is trying to tell is that, see, this Representation of People Act, it was enacted in the year 1951, right? But this is amended from time to time. There are various amendments to the uh, Re Representation of People Act. See, uh, this Act under the Section 33, Clause 7 says that a person or a candidate in India can contest for n number of constituencies. That means we have various territorial constituencies. These constituencies will, you know, elect a member to the assembly or to the parliament. But this, uh, the act says that one candidate can contest election from any number of constituencies. This is very important provision which was given by the Representation of People Act 1951. Right, but as of now, this, as I said, this Representation of People Act was amended uh, various times. Uh, but through one of the amendments, as of today, this Act says that yeah, one candidate can contest two constituencies. Maximum, he can contest from two constituencies. Okay, one candidate he can contest from two constituencies. 
this election commission is te uh, telling that instead of you know uh, allowing one person to contest from two constituencies please make that person to contest from only one seat see focus here it is asking the candidate or it is asking the government to make rules so that only one candidate will contest for one seat from one constituency this is one recommendation in another recommendation it is telling that if a candidate is you know contesting in the two constituencies if he wins both the seats in the uh, both the constituencies what he has to do is that ultimately he has to represent only one constituency but if he see for example he is contesting from x and y constituencies and the he is the candidate a candidate a is you know contesting from constituency x and y he wins both the constituencies that means he will emerge as the winner in both of the constituencies x and y but uh, in the parliament or in the legislative assemblies this person has to represent either x constituency or y constituency he cannot represent both the constituencies right because we have the single member constituencies but what has to, let us say, assume that this x will take he will represent the constituency x but this constituency y will remain vacant right since the a has exercised his uh, option for constituency x uh, constituency y will become vacant that means the by elections should be held to fill the vacancy to this y constituency see this will create some of the troubles what it is the election commission of india is telling that if the candidate has won both of the seats he will has to exercise power for only one constituency but the whatever the elections are going to be held for this vacant seat the electoral expenses must be borne by the can this candidate a this is the you know a recommendation of the election commission of india so because of this the electoral process or electoral reforms were in news very recently okay so we will go into deep uh, about these aspects okay let us study the section 337 of the rpa uh, that is representation of people act 1951 says that a candidate is permitted to contest an election from two different constituencies in a general election so this is important he can contest from two different constituencies right one candidate only single candidate can represent two different constituencies in a general election or general election or a group of by elections sometimes uh, various vacant seats uh, will be there all these vacancies will be filled with in, within a, with a single election that means the election commission of india will schedule uh, the election process and uh, in one election uh, process there will be various uh, 6 to 7 or 10 or 15 by elections will be there right that is called as the group of by elections another one is called the biennial elections this is important biennial elections see in the rajya sabha uh, the term of the members will be six years right uh, you every member he will you know uh, end his term uh, after six years the lok sabha mps are elected for five years rajya sabha mps are elected for six years and there is one more uh, provision in the constitution that rajya sabha is a continuous house it is not subjected to dissolution because of this after every two years one third members will retire from retire from the rajya sabha because after every two years members are retiring after every two years the elections must be held to fill the vacancies in the rajya sabha because of that they are called as the biennial elections do not confuse biennial with biannual right this is biennial and there is one more term called biannual both are different this is once in a two year this is biennial means once in biennial means once in a two years biannual means twice a year twice a year this is important the rajya sabha elections are held by nav that means once in two years okay if a person is elected from more than one seat then the person can only hold on to one of the seats that he or she won that means though he has won the both the seats he will hold on to only one seat that means he has to exercise power over only one constituency okay this is what the section 33 clause 7 of the representation of people act says as of today right but before 1996 this representation of people act was telling something differently what was it telling that 
before 1996 amendment the representation of india was uh, sorry in, uh, representation of people act was telling that a candidate can contest as from as many constituencies as possible for him that means uh candidate a could you know contest in uh, 10 constituencies or 15 constituencies or three or four whatever he wished in so many constituencies he could you know contest but in 1996 that provision was changed and the restrictions were imposed on the candidates to contest in the elections now uh, after 1996 uh, as of today the provision stands that w- uh, one candidate can contest maximum from two constituencies this is the uh amended version of the representation of people act 1951 now uh, you might be imagining what happens if a candidate contests from more than two constituencies what is the problem he can contest right he has the freedom in india he can there are various constituencies there is no bar why to restrict a candidate from contesting from more than two constituencies right see if you look into these two reasons you uh, you will be surprised why we have to restrict the candidates from uh, contesting in different constituencies you just read this unavoidable financial burden see if the candidate contests for more than two constituencies there will be too much financial burden on the public exchequer that means public money will be wasted the manpower and the other resources will be under burden see we have to deploy lot of a uh, security personnel during the elections you might have observed that there will be uh, crpf personnel rapid action force will be there state police forces will be there various uh, security agencies will be you know uh, coming and they will be ensuring the free and fair election that means the manpower involved is too much apart from policing agencies there will be teachers there will be other uh, banking personnel they will come and assist the uh, election process in india right see that means too much manpower is involved see uh, to conduct one elections multi crores of rupees are required thousands of crores of rupees are required if again and again these elections are held definitely it will be a huge burden on the public exchequer right so to avoid these kind of financial burden or uh, unnecessarily deploy security personnel and to waste the resources we have to restrict the the candidate from contesting uh, from more than two seats right and now election commission is telling that one candidate can contest from only one constituency then if you look into the if you can leave first reason as you know unreasonable or uh, un, uh, irrational you might uh, tell for time being but if you look into second point uh, this will be the injustice injustice to the voters of the constituency see uh they are voting uh, on based on a trust see there might be some five can let us say the five candidates are contesting from one uh, constituency right let us assume the five candidates are contesting a b c d e right uh the constituency uh, the yellow voters in that constituency will choose c as their uh, candidate the c wins in this constituency but why c has won because the people of that constituency have showed the trust on this person they thought that if they elect the person c he could perform well in the legislative procedure he can bring some of the social welfare schemes or he may improve his constituency based on some of the trust and because of his leader skills uh, leadership skills and all c was the winner but the c was also contesting in another constituency let us say the b constituency this was the a constituency right but if the c is also contesting in the uh, this constituency but now he will leave this constituency vacant so that means the c candidate c is making injustice to the voters who elected them in the earlier constituency people will be betrayed their they will feel that their the whatever the trust they imposed on the candidate c are you know false to avoid these kind of mistrust in the electoral process the candidate the uh, that means the candidate must be restricted from uh, contesting from more than two seats okay so these are the reasons or th- this will happen if the candidate you know contests from two seats then so is this a new trend in india a candidate contesting from two constituencies is this a new trend no it is not a new trend it is very old trend 
since the beginning of the electoral process in India, see I said the first elections were held in the year 1951, but if you look into the elections of 1957, uh, from that year onwards, that means the, there were other instances also in the 1951 or 52 also, but I have taken the very prominent names so that you can understand the concept very easily, right? So what I am telling is that since the beginning of the electoral process, the candidate, one candidate was representing various constituencies. These are the very well-known names. See, I have taken the names of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, L.K. Adwani, Sonia Gandhi, uh, present Prime Minister Narendra Modi, and uh, one prominent uh, leader, Rahul Gandhi. All these people have contested from more than one seat. In fact, the Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the previous Prime Minister, he contested from more than, sorry, uh, he contested in three constituencies, right? This is very old process. Still, it is continuing. But now we have to restrict this. We have to uh, change this provision in the legal system, right? So that you know, we can save a lot of money. Now, uh, since we are you know, discussing about the election process in India, let us look into some of the major challenges that are uh, there in front of the electoral system in India. Uh, major challenges are you can say that these are the major threats that will affect the free and fair election system in India. Right? Uh, first one, money power. What is this money power? In, in election, uh, during the elections, you might have observed uh, in the newspapers or in the TV channels, you might have heard and you might have read that so and so political party is distributing the money, so and so candidate is distributing uh, hundreds of thousands of rupees to each and each voter in his constituency. These are the news which are often read by us during the election time, right? See, a lot of money is involved. To bribe the can uh, voters or to influence the voters, these candidates will uh, spend hundreds of thousands of rupees. That means they will spend lakhs of crores of money. Crores of rupees are spent just to woo the uh, voters. So, so, so much of money is involved. Even some of, uh, during some times, uh, these political parties will favor such a candidate who, which will contribute generously to the particular political party. Let us say party X will favor uh, party A, sorry, candidate A because A has given a uh, course of rupees to this party. So that means during the election the money matters too much. To avoid, this is a threat to the uh, Indian democracy, right? This is the money power, muscle power also. Muscle power means uh, these you know uh, powerful people because of their uh, sheer strength of money or since the uh, they have a lot of money they also use the muscle power that means they will use the uh, goondas or goons goons or the goondas are deployed to uh, intimidate the candidates right pre-election intimidation or post-election victimization of the candidate will take place because of this uh, Gundagiri, right? Gundagiri is involved, a lot of black money is involved in the election system. These are the threats to the free and fair election system. Now, again, if you look into the third point, criminalization of politics and politicization of the crime. These are two are the uh, very important, you know, dangers which are uh, two sides of the same coin, right? What is criminalization of politics? That means criminals are entering into the political system. These gundas, these uh, the convicted persons, they are entering into the political system. In that way, the political environment is becoming criminalized. This is called as the criminalization of the politics and politicization of the crime. Some of the times, these uh, some of the people will commit the crime. This crime will take the political color. Uh, in uh, nowadays, the one major issue is going on in the Indian political field. Uh, one prominent leader is being questioned by uh, enforcement directorate. Uh, there are uh, chances, uh, that means there are allegations that this prominent leader has done some financial crimes. Because of that financial crime, he is being questioned. But this act of a leader has taken the politics, uh, political color. That means though he has done the crime, all the political people are supporting the criminal. They are, you know, demanding the. Uh, they are demanding that the leader should be released or he should not be questioned. See, everywhere in India now, there are protests are going on. 
this is called as the politicization of the crime one crime will get the politics political color and uh, these political people will you know fight for uh, absolution of that crime so this is called as the politicization of the crime criminalization of the politics and politicization of the crime then misuse of government machinery right misuse misuse of the government machinery what is, what what does this mean see the party which is in power it will take advantage of its power and it will exercise uh, or it will ask the government machinery to help that particular party so that it can win the upcoming elections again see these people which are who are in power they will use the government uh, transport system they will use the helicopters they will use the planes for campaigning uh, right for campaigning the candidates they will be asking the officials uh, to work for the party which is in power they may be asking some of the officers to work for the particular party in that way this government machinery is misused then uh, the non serious candidates in political parties some of the times what happens uh, the candidate let us say anup is you know uh, he is contesting uh, in a particular constituency let us say anup is contesting in one political uh, sorry uh, constituency what happens there will be some non serious candidates or frivolous frivolous candidates uh, with the same name anup actually this anup is the original person but to split the votes uh, if if there are various people who with the same name let us say anup 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 and anup if there are five anup in the same constituency uh, the political parties uh, they will find all these anup people with the same anup name and in that way they will split the votes see and me as a voter will go to the uh, election booth and i will be confused which anup right they will be having the same you know names anup a anup a and anup a if the, this was the actual candidate with the name anup a but i will be confused to which anup is my anup right see this is the in that way the people, uh, political parties will you know split the votes so that their opposition candidate will be easily defeated this is again a threat to the indian democracy there are freebies these part you know uh, political parties will announce freebies that means uh, these are the incentives given to the voters these are the entices that means they are like uh, giving uh, bribing the voters in the form of uh, freebies you see they will announce so the party will announce that if the party x comes to the power that party will you know wipe the farm loans it will wipe the electricity loans it may say that it will distribute the tvs it will distribute the uh, laptops tvs right so this is nothing but the enticing the voters that means they are owing the voters to vote for that particular party these these are the freebies then paid news and the fake news uh, the pop sometimes these political you know parties will publish the news item in the newspapers uh, in the form of advertisement but the people will think that the general public will think that it is the true news but right fake news also these parties again will publish a news in the newspapers which is a fake again to mislead the voters in this way uh, these are all the threats to the free and fair election system in india uh, these must be reduced as much as possible not as much as possible these all you know threats should be avoided in a uh, electoral electoral democracy right to prevent such you know uh, threats the government has tried seriously and it has constituted the central government has formed various committees to look into the electoral reforms what is electoral reform electoral reform is nothing but the effort towards bringing some positive changes in the election system in india see this is evolving process election process is continuously evolving this should evolve towards the positive changes ultimately we as the citizens of india must you know in the in the letter and spirit we must experience that the elections are truly held in the free environment which are, which are not biased right so in that regard the government has constituted various committees okay i have listed various committees like the tarkunde committee jay prakash narayan committee dinesh goswami ohara committee indrajit gupta committee law commission reports uh, which are published from time to time national commission to review the working of the constitution election commission of india's various re reform uh, reports jivan reddy committee the second administrative reforms commission these are high level committees which are constituted by the central government all of these committees have recommended various steps so which lead to the reforms in the electoral system of india
see uh, instead of going to all the committees let us say what the jay prakash narayan committee had said if this committee had said that change uh, it, it said to change the procedure of appointment of the chief election commissioner now there is no process actual process uh, there is no uh, proper uh, i mean uh, way in which election commissioner is appointed he is directly appointed by the president based on the recommendations made by the council of ministers right uh, headed by the prime minister this is the only procedure in which the election uh, chief election commissioner is appointed but jay prakash narayan committee said that let us change this procedure bring another tough process to uh, to appoint the chief election commissioner then it also said that uh, elect three member election commission this jay prakash narayan committee was uh, you know created in the uh, year 1974 uh, it was long back so during 1974 uh, this election commission of india was headed by only one member that is chief election commissioner but this jay prakash narayan a committee said that instead of one uh, let there be three members in the election commission of india these were the recommendations then dinesh goes dinesh goswami committee it was you know constituted in the year 1990 this committee said that no candidate should be allowed to contest an election from more than two constituencies see uh, in the year 1996 the amendment was made to the representation of india right based on the recommendation of the dinesh goswami committee that means earlier uh, one candidate could contest from any number of constituencies but this goswami committee said that let restrict the candidate to contest from only maximum of two constituencies this recommendation is the is already implemented by the government then it, this committee said the age of uh, candidates for assembly seats should be reduced to 21 Uh, and for the council it should be 25 see this committee had recommended to reduce the age of the, the contesting candidate uh, right now as of now the person who is aged 25 and above is eligible to become member of legislative assembly and uh, the member of parliament right the person who is above the age of 35 is eligible to become the rajya sabha member right Uh, to become the mlc or member of legislative council he should be having the age of 30 years right instead of 25 and 30 to contest uh, seats for uh, uh, mla and mlc this goes from the committee said let redu- let us reduce the age of a candidate to 21 to contest for assembly seat and reduce it to 25 year to contest for legislative council elections okay this is the uh, re- recommendation but this is not being implemented it also said to create the model code of conduct uh, you might have you no know, uh, you might be aware that when, whenever the election commission of india announces the dates for the election uh, let us say uh, elections for the lok sabha or to the legislative assembly of the state with the immediate effect there will be implementation of the mo- model code of conduct this code of conduct is nothing but pre agreed terms and conditions okay these terms and conditions are agreed by the the political parties and the contesting candidates right so this goswami committee had uh, had asked to implement the model code of conduct then uh, initially army and the paramilitary code for you know personal they were not having the voting rights the diplomats these you know paramilitary for, for forces they were some of these people were residing outside and they were uh, employed in the security of the country but they were not you know able to you know exercise their franchise this committee goswami committee said uh, that these people army people paramilitary people and the diplomats who were you know deployed outside they should also be allowed to vote and uh, because of this recommendation proxy voting was allowed okay proxy voting then it also recommended electronic voting machines now uh, in the general elections all the general elections of the states and the lok sabha uh, we are uh, using the electronic voting machines this recommendation was made by dinesh goswami committee see uh, based on the various recommendations of the different committees uh, now we are witnessing the some of the positive changes in the electoral reforms what kind of you know reforms have been brought let us see electoral reforms which were you know implemented before the 2010 the, there are various reforms major reforms which were implemented after 2010 and some were major reforms which were implemented before 2010 let us look into the reforms which were made before the 2010 the end, passing of the anti defection law in the year 1985 anti defection law it was aimed at preventing the 
switching of the parties by the candidates. Let us say a, part, a candidate, me as a candidate, uh, while uh, uh, contesting elections, I was representing the party X, but after you know uh, elections, I will be switching to the party Y. See, in that way, I was doing injustice to the party uh, which gave the ticket, and I was doing the injustice to the people who elected me. Right? To prevent this uh, phenomenon, the parliament enacted the anti defection law in the year 1985. See, there was a concept called Aya Ram and Gaya Ram. Aya Ram and Gaya Ram. That means a candidate came to one party and immediately he left the party and he entered another party. Aya and Gaya. He came and he went. See, overnight defections were there. Frequently, the candidates were you know, switching their political allegiance to different parties. To prevent that, the parliament enacted the anti defection law in 18, 1985. This is one of the very, you know, um, serious act which look, looks after the uh, disqualifications of the members of the parliament as well as the members of legislative assembly. Then in the year 1988, through the 61st Constitutional Amendment Act, the voting age of the people reduced from 21 to 18. Now, the voting age is 18 years. Earlier it was 21 years, right? In the 1988, this year was changed. That means voting age was reduced to 18 years. Then, Deputation to the Election Commission. In 1988, the people who were working for the Election Commission of India in the form of you know, preparing the electoral rules, rules or revising the rules or correcting the electoral rules, they were not recognized. But in the year 1988, uh, the contribution of these officers or the other staff recognized and they uh, it, was, it was recognized as the deputation to the Election Commission of India. Then, there was increase in the number of Proposers in the Raj Sabha elections, especially uh, initially, the number of proposers were less. As of now, if a candidate is contesting from for Raj Sabha seat, okay, he must be having the proposals of ten members. That means ten MPs should uh, agree to his nomination. That is called as the proposal. Okay, then for even for MLCs also, the number of proposers were increased. Okay, this is the. Uh, reform in the uh, Rajya Sabha election. Then electronic voting machines uh, were introduced. But see, these electronic voting machines were introduced in the uh, 1980s, especially they were tried in the 1980s during the by, uh, in, an, in a by-election in Kerala, right? On an experimental basis, uh, first EVMs were used in the Kerala by-election. But after that, uh, the, uh, again on the experimental basis, these EVMs were tried in the uh, general elections of the states in the Rajasthan, Goa, uh, and uh, sorry, in the Rajasthan and Delhi. After that, in a full scale, in one state like uh, Ra uh, Goa, in Goa in 1999, EVMs were used in the uh, complete state election process, right? From Goa is the first in the state uh, where the EVMs were deployed to conduct elections for the state legislative assembly. But at the central level, in 2004, EVMs were you know used. Right to to hold the elections for Lok Sabha seats. Then in 1989, there was one more reform that is adjournment of a poll or countermanding of the elections in case of booth capturing. Booth capturing. This is important. Earlier, when there was a ballot system, now we are uh, having the uh, EVMs. Right before having the EVMs, we were uh, you know uh, having the ballots. Right paper ballots. What was happening? Uh, paper ballots were there. Okay, these booth capturing nothing but uh, in a group of uh, in a large group, the gundas or the miscreants were entering into the election uh, uh, booth. In that booth, they were creating the uh, They were you know involving the miscreations. They were taking these paper ballots and uh, they were intimidating the people. And on this paper ballot, they were exercising the vote for the for their preferred candidate in that way uh, through the through their muscle power and through their intimidating activities uh, they were you know uh, making one particular person to win from that uh, booth okay or from that constituency this is called as the booth capturing and in the year 1989 election commission of india said that if booth capturing takes place there should be adjournment of the whole election process in that constituency or countermanding of the election that means cancelling of the elections Okay, in 1980, 1993, epic, that means 
electors photo identity card epic was uh, they were introduced before 1993 there were no id cards in the election they are called as the voter id this voter id was you know uh, implemented in the year 1993 then there is a prohibition of sale of liquor in and around the election area right then disqualification on the conviction for violating the prevention of insults to the national honor act 1971 what are national honors like symbols of national honor like uh, national flag national anthem constitution of india map of india all of these and other various you know um, aspects they constitute the national honors right they are the symbols of national honor if a candidate insults any of our national symbols of national honor he will be disqualified this was implemented from the year again okay, this was again disqualification of such a member was you know one more such reform then rajya sabha elections now uh, earlier uh, there was one provision uh, the, if a person has to become rajya sabha member he must contest the election in his own state right uh, for example if a candidate is from karnataka he must you know uh, contest the rajya sabha seat in the karnataka only now this provision was removed right as of now any candidate even he is from haryana he can come to karnataka and he can contest the rajya sabha seat in the karnataka okay this was the new reform made uh, in the rajya sabha election again there is a open ballot system uh, in general elections which were held uh, on the adult franchise basis uh, the there is a system called secret ballot system in the elections which were you know held for the uh, legislative assemblies or for the uh, lok sabha Uh, those elections are based on the secret ballot system but rajya sabha elections are now open ballot system so this was the major reform again model, model code of conduct was evolved initially it was you know implemented on a uh, experimental basis in the 1960s in the state uh, elections but in 1990s uh, this model code of conduct uh, ha- has become the major uh, okay uh, what do you call uh, major uh, reform major reform to hold candidates accountable right then the major reforms which were implemented or which were introduced after the year 2010 let us look at those reforms the ceiling on the election expenditure now in uh, after 2010 now there is a ceiling limit that means maximum limit a candidate can spend in an election a candidate now he is allowed to spend the maximum 50 to 70 lakh rupees in the lok sabha election and he is allowed to spend uh, 20 to 28 lakh rupees in a state assembly election okay now there is a restriction on the exit polls in 2019 exit poll means uh, whatever the surveys which are conducted by the news channels or the newspapers uh, after the elections are Uh, conducted right uh, whenever uh, you know election takes place in a particular constituency after the election process is over in that constituency these new channels were going and they were asking the people which party they favored so in that way these exit polls were you know they were influencing the minds of the voters in another constituency right in the 2019 election commission of india put the restriction on this also and it uh, it said that the exit poll results could be broadcast only after the final phase of the elections war or Uh, they are over that means till the complete process of election gets over uh, till that point no results of the exit polls should be announced in any of the media right this is the uh, very important reform again in the uh, they have created awareness among the people that means by observing january 25 as the national voters day the election commission of india is trying to create awareness regarding the election and their importance right in this way uh, by observing the january 25 as the national voters day it is creating a lot of awareness among the citizens of india this january 25 was selected as the voters day because the election commission of india was established on january 25 in the year 1950 right then declaring of criminal antecedents and assets etc the candidate who is contesting the election he must declare he is criminal antecedents that means whatever the criminal cases he has he has to make them public then what what how much you know uh, uh, asset he is having that asset must be you know publicized he must you know uh, uh, fill one affidavit and in that affidavit uh, in that affidavit he must declare all his criminal uh, antecedents or the criminal cases whatever the assets he has right 
uh, if he fails to fill this affidavit it will you know lead to the imprisonment up to 6 six, six months right so if a candidate fails to fill the affidavit he will be imprisoned for 6 months or he will be fined or he can be fined plus he will be put behind the bars for 6 months then uh, in 2013 none of the above option was introduced in the general elections the uh, me as a candidate uh, i mean voter i am going to the election booth and in that booth i am i will not prefer any of the candidates fielded by the political parties i will not uh, but uh, initially uh, though i did not favor i mean there was no provision to uh, exercise my this kind of negative vote but uh, from 2013 uh, to 2013 onwards election commission of india has introduced none of the above Uh, option that means let us say in a constituency there are five candidates uh, uh, sixth you know option will be your nota if you are not willing to prefer any of the candidates fielded by the political parties these five people right they will be uh, they, they they will not be preferred by me and i will exercise my franchise for none of the above option that means i i i i will hold my option i will not prefer any of these candidates then introduction of voter verified paper audit trial that means since we are using the evms uh, earlier we were not knowing whether my vote was you know perfect or not uh, but uh, from uh, there is a new provision called vv pat that means now if i after you know exercising my franchise in the electronic voting machine i can verify my vote whether it is properly voted or not whether that vote has went to my preferred candidate or not see that paper audit will come out the trail of a paper will come out and i can verify my vote yes my vote is being properly put okay this is vv pat then electoral bond scheme was introduced in the year 19, 2018 that means earlier lot of political funding was taking place uh, many businessmen various other citizens they were donating their money to the political parties but Uh, how much these political parties are getting money from where they are getting how much is being donated by different persons it was not known by uh, anyone but in 2018 uh, the government introduced the electoral bond scheme through this any of the people can buy the electoral bonds and they can donate to the political party but these since these bonds are distributed by the financial uh, institutions in the country uh, we can easily judge how many electoral bonds are sold and how much money is generated by the political party this is the uh, newest reform introduced by the uh, government these are all the various type of electoral reform which are being which are brought by the government but still a lot to, has to be done to, to make the election process very clean now there are various recommendations made by the election commission but they are uh, still pending that means they are not approved by the government what election commission was asking that uh, election commission sought the power to deregister the political parties as of now the election commission of india has the power to register the political parties but it does not have the power to deregister the political party now this uh, commission is asking that if a political party is involved in, in the tax evasion that means if a party is uh, evading the tax that means it is and giving very less amount of tax or if it is showing the uh, double standards that means it is generating too much of income but it is on the paper it is telling it is, it is telling that uh, it is generating very low income by showing the low income it is evading the tax if the it is if it is found that if a part, particular political party is involved in the tax evasion that must be d registered this is the power being asked by the election commission of india but it is still not approved by the government then it is also asking to amend the representation of the people act to provide two year imprisonment in case of uh, filing a false affidavit i said uh, the candidate he has to file a affidavit uh, by declaring all his assets by declaring his all criminal antecedents but what if a candidate files a false affidavit then the commission is asking if a candidate is you know filing the false affidavit he must be imprisoned for more than 2 years if a person is imprisoned for more than 2 years he will be debarred from contesting the elections for next upcoming 6 years right <coughs> this is the you no know, power being asked by the election commission of india but this uh, is uh, the decision is uh, you no know, pending by the government now what has to be done we have seen that various reforms have been introduced 
right? Uh, from time to time, still various reform measures are being uh, pending. They are made. Uh, they, okay, the reforms uh, are pending by the government. But what has to be done to move forward to make election process very clean and to, to make it fair and free to uh, to make people believe more and more in the election system? What we have to do? What is the way forward? Let us look into that. Uh, we have to provide, or the government has to provide the legal powers to the election commission to punish for the violations of the provision of model code of conduct. Now, as of now, this model code of conduct is a very good device to make the candidates accountable and to make the political parties accountable during the election time. But if uh, the candidate or the political party violates the model code of conduct, there is no punishment. The election commission of India just it will tell that you have violated some conduct or it has violated the rule, but it cannot punish the now what the government should do punishable powers to the election commission of India so that it can really become uh, the major institution to make elections very free and fair. Now it has become because it doesn't have the legal powers to punish the violators of the rules. And now it is being called as the toothless tiger. To make this election commission very strong, we have to do this power. And then we have to implement, or the government has to implement the recommendations given by the second administrative reforms commission. What we said, uh, second ARC said, it said to tighten the anti-defection law. As of now, the the people who are disqualified under the anti-defection law, okay, uh, the power to disqualify the member of the parliament or member of the legislative assembly is given to the presiding officers of the lower house. That means the speaker is given the power to disqualify a member based on the uh, anti-defection law. Now, the election, uh, sorry, the second year she said that instead of giving powers to the speakers of the uh, you know, lower houses give this power to the president or the governor so that they can act in a neutral manner. Sometimes these speakers will be influenced by the party, right? Uh, they will be influenced by the politi uh, party politics. To avoid the party politics in the uh, anti, you know, uh, while the deep disqualifying the member, the power should be given to the president or the governor. Then, it is the second ARC recommended the collegium system to appoint the chief election commissioner and other commissioners. Collegium means it is the group of you know uh, people uh, who will you know uh, recommend the president of India to appoint a particular person. See this uh, ARC said the prime minister, speaker, leader of opposition in the Lok Sabha, the law minister, and the deputy chairman of the Rajya Sabha. All these people sit together and they should be make the one collegium. This collegium should you know, um, recommend the president regarding the election or the selection of the chief election commissioner. As of now, uh, this kind of provision is not there. If this is implemented, it, this is the major reform, right? Then special election tribunals. The ARC is telling or the second administrative reforms commission is recommending that to establish the special election tribunals across the country at the regional level under the article 323b of the constitution. Article 323b deals with the tribunals. There are various kinds of tribunals. Administrative tribunals are there, election tribunals are there, right? Various tribunals are there. This commission or uh, the second ARC is recommending to establish special election tribunals so that the election disputes or the disposals can be, uh, sorry, uh, uh, electoral disputes can be disposed of very quickly. Okay. Then, uh, these are the three very important recommendations made by the Second Administrative Reforms Commission. Then, uh, next way forward is to filing of the election petition even against the defeated candidates on the ground of corrupt practice. What happens? Only the uh, candidate who has won the election, he will be questioned by the uh, legal process, but instead of only asking the person who has won the election, the defeated candidate must also be questioned if he has involved in the corrupt practices, right? This is the way forward again. Then we have to put ban on the transfer of officers likely to serve the ele election. Sometimes what happens, the party in politi the party which is in power, it will influence the minds of the servants, that means the public servants, it will favor some of the uh, civil servants who, who will favor their own party. We have to ban the transfer of such politically influenced transfers, right? Then auditing the finances of the political parties. 
the political parties under the elect, uh, electoral bond scheme and other various provisions they are getting too much money donated money from the general public this you know uh, the income of the parties must be questioned by the public that means it should be uh, exposed to the auditing by the public then implementing the ceiling on the expenses of political parties during the election period as of now there is a ceiling limit on the uh, political expenses by individual candidate i, I, I said that uh, 60 to 70 lakh for lok sabha election and 20 to 28 lakh uh, for the assembly elections this is the ceiling limit on the individual candidate but there is no ceiling limit on the political party as a whole for expending the money the political party can expend any amount of money uh, during the election process now uh, if if we put the ceiling limit on the expenses of the political party as a whole we can really bring some of the changes right we can reduce the in, uh, influence of money power in the election process then prohibition of taking other officers after retirement of the election commissioners what happens if, now if the election commissioners are re retired after serving in the election commission of india they will be posted somewhere else also either in government or uh, outside the government they will be uh, posted but now these officers must be prevented from assuming any of the roles in the public field because uh, otherwise what happens they will be easily influenced by the uh, party politics right declare the political parties as the public authorities for the sake of right to information act see under section 8a of the right to information act uh, there is a concept called public authorities these public authorities are nothing but the uh, all the state governments, central government and various third tier governments as well as the any of the institution which is substantially funded by the government. And they all constitute the public authorities. But we have to declare political parties as the public authorities so that the political parties can be brought under the ambit of Right to Information Act. Okay. If we implement all these reforms, okay, if these are the ways forward, all these if these ways are you know implemented in their true spirit. Uh, and in their true letter and spirit, we can really enjoy the corruption free election process in India. Really, we can enjoy the uh, free and fair elections. Really, we can become the role model for the rest of the world uh, in the representative democracy. Okay, so this is all about the electoral reforms. We'll let us meet in the next video.